here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is John Davi, founder and CEO at Astoria Portfolio Advisors. Astoria is an investment management firm that specializes in EDF managed portfolios, and they recently released their 10 EDFs for 2023 report, uh, which is basically their top ideas, their best ideas for this year, which we are going to discuss today. John, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start uh, with your market outlook for this year. Uh, last year was very challenging for investors. And uh, in fact, stocks staged a nice rally at the beginning of this year because inflation data raised hopes that the Fed would slow the pace of interest rate hikes. But that rally proved to be very short lived and fears, concerns about the likelihood of recessions are rising again. So tell us about what is your outlook for this year in terms of stocks and fixed income performance? So just for background, we are a macro top down uh, oriented you know, firm that puts together ETF models um, and our differentiation is that we'll use factors you know, to kind of express our macro views because, you know, factors are cyclical. And then we use liquid alternatives to kind of hedge our downside risk. So, you know, just for perspective, you know, last year, um, you know, past performance on ticket of future results. But, you know, last year we were able to navigate our client portfolios pretty well on a relative basis. Um, you know, we had uh, our best year ever in terms of, you know, managing uh, risk versus the benchmark, you know, past performance, again, is not a ticket future result. I was very worried about markets last year. I think this year, not nearly as worried. So when I see things like, you know, the worst return for the 60-40 portfolio in decades, you know, the Lehman having its worst year ever in, in the history of the ag, like, it's hard to see a repeat of that. Um, you know, I wouldn't say, like, I'm wildly bullish, but I just don't think we're going to have the same sort of, like, pressure in, in portfolios like we did last year. So, you know, you know, with that said, you know, I, I would say we're taking, you know, less risk, you know, than last year, um, you know, using more alternatives this year, you know, not having like kind of outsized risk, you know, in terms of like overweight and underweights, you know, from an equity standpoint to a fixed income standpoint. So. OK, so uh, tell us a little bit about how you decided the major themes or uh, allocation between different kind of asset classes, stocks, bonds and alternatives. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, thinking uh, when you structured this model portfolio for 2023. Sure. So, you know, I, I think there's three things to kind of remember f for this year. First is that you know, the consensus views doesn't usually pan out. So if I think about what is the consensus right now, it's that we're going to have an economic recession, we're going to have an earnings recession, and the Fed's going to cut rates in the second half of the year. I don't think all three will will manifest, you know, perhaps one. Um, you know, what I really care about, you know, for our investors is, you know, are we going to have another kind of left tail risk in the S&P? So down 20% is, you know, is tough. Um, but down 20% multiple back-to-back -back years, you know, that, that's really disastrous for long-term wealth accumulation. So, you know, not, not that we have a crystal ball and we make predictions on the S&P, but, you know, the macro environment is definitely deteriorating, no doubt. You know, PMIs, manufacturing data, you know, housing data. I think, like, we're advocating using alternatives and using more bonds and laddering your bonds, you know, to kind of hedge your risk. So, um, you know, the other kind of big picture view, Nina, is that I think we have to, like, you know, counsel listeners and advisors. And, you know, generally speaking, right now, it, it's a better time to invest in, than last year. So yields are high, right? So you're getting more fixed income, you know, bang for your buck this year than you were, you know, last year and the year before. You know, and valuations outside of the U.S. large cap index, you know, they're attractive, right? So I've seen periods in my career where bear markets, recessions, where you've got, you know, 20p ratio, 
you know, in different sectors and growth stocks. And, you know, some growth stocks are still pretty expensive, but, you know, XUS, small cap, mid cap, you know, value, dividend paying stocks, they're all trading at a premium discount to the S&P. So, you know, if you have a multi-year time horizon, you should kind of ignore some of the noise and sort of forget it type thing. So, Okay, that's interesting. So let's um, discuss some of these themes. And let's start with your commodities allocation. So last year was a good year for commodities, particularly the first half of last year when commodity prices surged uh, with supply chain disruptions, uh, which were uh, further worsened by the war in the unfortunate war in Ukraine. Uh, they didn't do so well in the second half of the year, but still outperformed uh, both stocks and bonds significantly. But lately, the signs of inflation peaking, easing, even though I, I should add that food prices have remained stubbornly high, as we have seen during our visits to grocery stores. So tell us a little bit about the outlook for commodities and uh, the investment case for commodities uh, in the current environment. Sure. So so you're referring to our 10 ETFs for 2023 report, um, which, you know, I'll just give you kind of the background of Genesis, if, if that works for you. Um, so so what I wanted to do about 10 years ago when I first started producing this, re producing this report was to kind of, you know, give like what the sell side and some, you know, Byron Wien, you know, top 10 surprises and these type of like predictions. Um, and I said, you know, let's put together a list of ETS that we think would do well for the next uh, year. And, you know, I was a sell side ETF index analyst so i didn't have like a portfolio i would run so just from a disclosure standpoint i would just say that you know we actually now have portfolios people should actually look at our portfolios to see like how we're managing you know risk in this environment um you know like the 10 etfs you know we own some of these etfs we don't own all of them there's some that we're looking at but you know th this is just like idea sharing try and capture themes and be in the front foot so last year's list beat the S&P 500 by 9%. Uh, it was a very good year last year. And, you know, anecdotally, I would say about 70 of the ideas in the list usually are in the money. So, you know, I, I think it speaks to a couple of things. One is that, you know, we, we, we have a good sound macroeconomic process. We can identify trends, key trends in the marketplace. And if you don't trade a lot, if you have a long-term time horizon, like, you know, there is this potential that you could, you know, have a good experience, let's say. So last year was all about kind of lowering duration, tilting away from the large cap index, having inflation fighters. And, you know, we sub advise this PPI, the Axis uh, inflation ETF, um, which did well last year, having liquid alt, you know, so that translated into like a pretty good year, not just for the 10 ETFs, but, you know, for our ETF portfolios. Um, you know, when I think about this year list, you know, we have more bonds and alternatives than equities. So that kind of is the first time that that's ever happened. That really does capture kind of our view on markets. Um, and I think basically, Nina, like inflation is still going to be stubbornly high. So we're still quite constructive on their PPI ETF that we have. And, and I think because inflation stays high, you know, terminal rates is still going to have to be pegged, you know, three, four percent. So I just don't subscribe to this idea that like, okay, we're going to have a recession. The Fed's going to like cut rates. You know, I feel like it's going to be anchored around that three, four percent range. So I like commodities still. They were under owned for the last decade. Uh, I think agricultural commodities can stay stubbornly higher. So if you think about like you know milk and bread and you know corn prices, like you know some of these like just are a lot stickier. I think like oil and energy can be more cyclical as the economy slows, oil and energy will slow. So, you know, we like physical ag. So we have like PDBA in our list. We've got Moo, that's agricultural stocks. Um, you know, we like glitter. That's like a precious metals allocation. I think that's going to, you know, it's, it's doing well because recession risks have elevated. Plus, I think, you know, a weaker dollar and, and crypto blown up is a, is a good tailwind for precious metals. So that's kind of our view on like historically the background of, of the report and then how we're positioned this year and going into a couple of specifics about commodities. 
Right. So I saw a recent uh, report by Goldman Sachs, and according to them, commodities have the strongest outlook of any asset class in 2023. And uh, they say that's mainly because of lack of supply and still these uh, low amount of inventories. And also they expect a robust uh, recovery in Chinese demand. And we know that China is one of the biggest consumers of commodities in the world. Uh, so it's possible that commodities will continue to do well this year. And uh, I found these two agribusiness related uh, ETFs interesting. So one is Venek Agribusiness ETF, uh, which you mentioned more. Uh, this invests in agribusiness companies like Deer and Nutrien. And the other one by Invesco is uh, the one which invests in commodity futures uh, like CAT cattle, etc. The ticker symbol is PDBA. Uh, for precious metals, uh, you went for the one which invests in a basket of uh, precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, etc. So tell us why you chose a precious metals ETF instead of a gold ETF. Just, just for diversification, um, you know, gold is kind of late cycle and some of the other metals are it could be more early cycle. Um, you know, I, I just, I, we always want to be more diversified at Astoria. So we just thought instead of just owning gold, let's just own like a basket of precious metals. So the glitter ETF is you know, something that we, you know, we have in, in our ETF portfolios. And we just think, you know, I mean, crypto was taking so much, you know, spotlight from away from gold, you know, the last three, four or five years. And, you know, I don't think it's ironic that the minute crypto blew up, you started seeing gold do well. So, um, you know, historically, gold does well in a recession. Uh, and I think the gold market is definitely signal and, you know, increased elevated recession risks. Now, let's talk about your dividend ETFs. And uh, dividend ETFs are always popular with investors. And last year, they were very, very popular. Uh, they saw a lot of uh, inflows last year. And uh, in fact, most dividend ETFs did quite well last year because these these are usually uh, stable companies uh, with stable cash flows and solid balance sheets. Uh, so they tend to do well when uh, the economy slows down. So in terms of your ETF selection, I saw a mix of uh, dividend growth as well as high dividend uh, ETFs. So SDY selects companies that have consistently increased their dividends for at least 20 years. And uh, SPYD uh, invests in 80 highest dividend paying companies within the S&P 500 index. And then there's DVY, uh, which uh, selects high dividend paying companies, but which have a record of of at least five years of consistently paying dividends. So tell us about uh, a little bit about these ETFs and why you like them. So if I think, you know, as a long-term strategic, you know, kind of portfolio, you know, structure, like remember, you know, for 10 years old, people wanted to own was tech and growth stocks. Nobody wanted to own cash flow, producing, you know, dividend paying stocks. And I'm saying on a relative basis, I think what we saw last year was that once interest rates rose, right, you know, it really does impact these longer duration assets. So companies that have no dividends, no cash flows, you know, they tend to, um, you know, be, you know, penalized when you've got like a higher, you know, terminal rate and, and higher interest rate. So SDY, DVY, SPY, D, you know, you're looking, I mean, SDY is a little bit higher. The forward P ratio is 16. DVY, SPY, D is more like 10 to 12. Um, so I think like the market is rewarding lower multiple stocks, companies that produce cash flows. So we, we put three in there just to kind of be diversified. Um, you know, it's kind of spread our bets across the different, you know, factor and the, how they construct those ETFs. But, you know, conceptually, I think, you know, you want to be owning cash flow producing entities. So kind of go back to basics. So, you know, a lot of those long duration tech stocks that are unprofitable, they, you know, kind of like those hope and dream scenarios. But I think the market is saying we're going to reward companies that actually have fundamentals. And, and, and that's a good thing, right? We want to return to like normalcy and return to fundamentals. So 
it was important that we had like a dividend paying theme in, in that list. A lot of money went into it last year. Um, and, and it is like defensive in general. So some of those ETFs did quite well relative to the, you know, relative to the S and P, um, you know, SPY, D, DVY, SDY, you know, down one, down two, uh, DVY up two. I mean, that's very strong relative outperformance. So we'll see if our view that like the macro economy is slowing, you know, they should on a relative basis still do well. Um, the key is like, okay, if there is like this cyclical, you know, turnaround in the back half of the year, then you usually there's like an early cycle play and people may rotate back into cyclical and growth oriented stocks. But for now, I think you can be comfortably long with dividend paying securities. So you mentioned the importance of cash flows. So let's talk about uh, the cash cows ETF in the list. It is the PESA US cash cows 100 ETF, ticker symbol cows COWC. And this saw a lot of interest from investors last year and gathered about 9.3 billion dollars in assets. Very impressive. Uh, so this basically invests in cash rich companies, companies with very strong cash flows and very healthy balance sheets. Tell us why you decided to include the CTF. Yeah, so and we don't use this one yet. So again, this is an example. Of, I want to just make let the listener know, like, you know, we like it. You know, it's interesting. I think the concept is what we're trying to deliver. Um, you know, we haven't used it just because, you know, we've got other stuff currently in the portfolio. But, you know, I think this idea of like, you know, high quality stocks, you know, quality is one of these factors that's, you know, persistent, pervasive, robust. You know, if I look at the, you know, the ROE of that ETF, it's like 32 percent. The ROA is 11. I mean, this is much higher than, you know, than a lot of the other ETFs we have on our list. So, again, I think this idea that, like, you're a cash flow producing entity, I think the market is rewarding it. And I think Pace has done, like, a really good job, um, you know, penetrating theme in, in the marketplace. And I know it was a big fan favorite last year. So that's why we put it in our list. Right. Yeah, we had Pacer on the show last year. A very impressive performance in terms of inflows, um, in terms of returns by the sweet uh, cash cow suite uh, for sure. Uh, now for the mid cap allocation, you went for quality. It is an ETF by Invesco XMHQ. Tell us about this ETF. So, you know, conceptually, what we wanted to like tell investors is like, you know, you want to go into like mid and small cap stocks and, and you know in fairness like as the economy weakens like you know they're not going to be susceptible like we don't expect inverse correlation per se but you know everyone wanted to own tech and large cap us index the last decade you know s&p had like a one sharp ratio and historically it's like a three four sharp ratio so you know that won't repeat itself going forward so you know there's a new theme uh, there will be a new theme and a new trend. And I feel like, you know, we want to get our portfolios more towards, you know, the mid cap, smaller cap space. So even when we design stock portfolios, you know, we equal it our portfolios just to try and capture that size premium. You know, the, the key message is tilt away from large cap index, U.S. large cap index, you know, this year and the years to come. And we like mid caps because I think it's kind of that sweet spot. Small cap stocks are, you know, pretty rely on the credit cycle. Um, you know, there's sensitivities to when spreads blow out. Um, so w w we like quality stocks. And, you know, I think the way Invesco screens for it and the index provider, you know, it made a lot of intuitive sense for us. So, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, quality is one of these factors that's persistent, pervasive, robust. So. Yes, uh, quality stocks make a lot of sense in the current market environment. Now let's talk about your fixed income ETFs uh, that you have in the report. And you recommend significant allocation to fixed income. And we know that last year was a terrible uh, year for 
bonds. But this year, I have seen that many strategists are recommending higher allocation to bonds. And investors are looking at bonds again because uh, yields are at levels which are not seen since the um, global financial crisis. So some investments to bonds does make a lot of sense. So tell us how you selected the fixed income ETF in this report. Tell us a little bit about those ETFs. So the idea of this year is that, you know, now you can finally get some yield. And, you know, all asset classes compete one, with one another, right? So if interest rates, you know, risk-free is 4%, the terminal rates, you know, 4 4 4.5%, you know, do you want to buy a bond and take no risk? Do you want to own stock and take a lot of downside risk? Um, you know, do you want to invest in, the, you know, commercial real estate, a duplex, a housing? Like, do you want to go into private equity? Like, so... As I think about terminal rate being high and but with the potential that it'll stay high because inflation will remain stubbornly high, you know, we just thought it was important that we, you know, co communicate with our investors that, you know, hey, now there's a room for fixed income. We saw a lot of, you know, crazy behavior the last few years where people were not getting income at the bank and they were, you know, doing instead of the 60 40 portfolio, they were doing, you know, 75 25. And, you know, I knew we were in trouble when I started seeing that type of behavior. So, you know, our view is like, okay, let's, you know, stay on the short end of the curve because the yield curve is inverted. Um, so things like X1, you know, was interesting to us. I think, you know, Invesco does some really interesting bullet shares. So we said, okay, let's get some laddered exposure to corporates and, and munis. So that's like tickers like BSCO and BSMO. And then, you know, typically in a recession, the back end of the curve, you know, outperforms. So as growth slows, you get this recession, you know, long dated treasuries kind of, um, you know, rally and do well. So if you think about you know, 2001, 2002, 2008, even March 2020, the long dated treasury bond, you know, did, did pretty well. Um, it, you know, it outperformed. So it acts like an inverse correlation hedge. So we thought let's overall hedge our fixed income risk with SPTL. Makes sense. Uh, now let's talk about your night shares ETFs allocation, which uh, surprised me a little bit. So these are night effect alternative equity ETF uh, NSPY and NSPL. So now there is academic re research uh, which shows that after hours trading produces a better risk return profile than investing during market hours. But uh, these two ETFs and the third one in their suite, um, I looked at the performance. They haven't really done well. Uh, and, and SPY and, and IWM, in fact, have underperformed their respective benchmarks. And the size remains uh, very small, I think three, four million dollars each, though very interesting strategies, I would add. So tell us about your thinking behind these two ETFs, why you added these ETFs to the list. So conceptually, big picture, you know, I mentioned before that S&P had a one sharp ratio, uh, and now we don't think that that's going to repeat. So we're trying to manufacture, you know, other ways to get risk relative to the return. So we do want to use alternatives in order to kind of, you know, produce return, but, you know, kind of have lower risk, let's say. So, you know, the night shares, which, you know, started by Bruce Levine, and he's got a big, deep background in the ecosystem. I, I put it this way, Nina, like 10, 15 years ago, I was on a Morgan Stanley ETF, you know, desk. And, you know, I remember looking at this night effect back then. Um, it's kind of well known that like during the day you've got these, you know, risk off scenarios where either an economic announcement comes out, Fed speak, you know, institutional managers kind of delever. So the night typically rewards you more than the day session. So if you think about sharp ratios overnight versus the day, you know, you are better off holding at night. Um, you mentioned our performance. That really is just because of when the ETF was launched, you had a period, you know, in June, July, the summer, where you had like a pretty big bear market rally, and most of it came came in the day session. But you know, whenever we make an investment decision, we're not going to go based on, you know, a three month, you know, you know, period or a six month track record. I mean, 
there's 20 years worth of data showing that the night effect, and again, thanks to futures, you know, you can actually trade this effect. Um, so, you know, people in hedge funds have been doing this for many, many years before the night shares ETF was launched. So, um, you know, the one that we actually like uh, is the NSPL, which is your long, you know, 150% at night and your long during the day as well. So you don't have to be concerned about, you know, missing the day session. Um, so it's like 150% long at night and 100% long during the day. And I think that one has outperformed, you know, S&P since it was launched. But, um, you know, th that to us fills up our alternative bucket. And I think, you know, conceptually makes a lot of sense. And it's kind of right up our wheelhouse in terms of what we, you know, are trying to do on the alternative side. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to briefly talk about your inflation hedge ETF. Uh, the ticker symbol is PPI. You alluded to this ETF earlier. This is not included in the list this year, but uh, it was the top 10 ETFs of 2022 in your guide last year and this ETF did quite well last year and it invests in uh, multiple asset classes uh, which uh, are likely to do well in an inflationary environment including cyclical stocks, commodities and tips. Tell us a little bit about this ETF and why it did so well last year. Yeah, and I've had a lot of people say, like, how come I didn't put it in the list? And, you know, I don't usually repeat tickers, um, you know, so so we just don't repeat tickers um, from one year to the next. But obviously, you know, I'm still very bullish on it. And I personally own a lot of it uh, in my own account. And so a lot of my you know colleagues um, at work. So in, in that, I think, you know, more portfolio managers should, you know, eat their own cooking in general. But, um, you know, I, I think last year, you know, we were up 4%. You know, we beat the S&P by, you know, 20%. We beat the benchmark by 14%. I think it shows you, like, how there's a buyer strike for, you know, value-centric assets, which is ultimately what PPI owns. So, you know, 70-ish percent is in energy, material stocks. You know, we'll have, you know, 10% towards, you know, fixed income securities you know, then the balance would be in like um, things like commodities, commodity equities. So, you know, I just think for the last 10 years, we didn't have any inflation with deflation. And, you know, I feel like we we wanted to have, you know, a way to kind of hedge our inflation risk. So that's why we went ahead and worked with Access and we, you know, launched the CTF. Um, you know, the P ratio was eight, right? So still very, very cheap. And, you know, I think it, did what we thought it would do last year. Um, were we surprised about the inverse correlation? You know, absolutely. But, you know, also I would say that not a lot of people owned this type of stuff. So if not a lot of people own it, then it feels like, you know, you have less risk in general. So we were pretty happy with it and we're still, you know, very constructive on this theme of owning inflation. So it is multi-asset and it is active. And I think you know, inflation being such a highly nuanced area, you want to have a skilled active manager. So I mentioned like, you know, we rotated out, you know, we don't own as much energy and oil and we own, you know, more precious metals and agriculture on a relative basis. So that's, um, you know, something that we, you know, feel pretty strongly about. Excellent stuff. Uh, that's all we have time for today. John, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So that was John Darby of Astoria. Let's quickly recap some of the ETF tickers that we discussed. Uh, for dividend, we talked about DVY, iShares Select Dividend ETF, SDY, Spider S&P Dividend ETF, and SPYD, Spider Portfolio S&P 500 high dividend ETF. For cash cows, we talked about Baser US cash cows 100 ETF, ticker symbol cows. And then for commodities, uh, we talked about the agriculture commodity ETF by Invesco, ticker symbol PDPA. And the Venec agribusiness ETF uh, ticker symbol MU and we also discuss uh, the precious metal CTA by Aberdeen the ticker symbol is GLTR Glitter 
Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And also make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.